Well, as many of you know, maybe some of you don't, my family and I, um, three years ago, moved back from living in Italy. Uh, we were there for 13 years, and the first couple years, um, we, we were living in the city, and the city is called Salerno, where it's kind of sandwiched right between the Tyrrhenian Sea and a mountain range, and so you don't have to look very far to see tremendously high mountains in the distance. And every day, not every day, but almost every day, I would sit on the edge of the city near the sea where you're looking out at the mountains, and I would just look at the, the highest peak of the farthest mountain and just think, one day, that's going to be mine. I'm going to tackle that peak. And so sure enough, I couldn't handle it anymore. I had to get out of the city. I grabbed a group of friends, and we drove our car to what seemed to be the most likely point of entrance to this mountain, and we just started walking. We didn't know where we were walking as long as we were going up and in the general direction of this mountain peak. Now, after, I, I don't even remember how many hours. It was a lot longer and further and harder than we had thought, but we made it to the top, and when I got up there, it was absolutely breathtaking. You could look over the whole city that we called home, see the beauty of that city in the far distance now. You could turn and face east and see uh, countless more mountain ranges and cities and towns. You could see everything. The view gave me perspective about the size of the world that we live in, uh, the beauty of this country that we called home, the goodness of God and his beauty and creation. But you know what else we found up there? Any guesses? Absolutely nothing. <laughs> Have you ever been to the top of a mountain? There's nothing up there. It's empty. No animals, no trees, no shade, no life at all. Just rocks and dirt. And that's the thing about mountain peaks. The higher you go, the more desolate it becomes. There's no life up there. Why? Because life was down there in the valley. I could see the city that we lived in bustling with cars and movement. Animals that we passed were on the way up where there was trees and food and provision. While I was up there, I realized something extremely valuable that my family and I had been overseas at that point for about three years. We were in a very difficult season of life. We are at the very early stages of planting a church in a very hard secular country. We had four small children. I think at that point they were two, three, four, and five years old. Do the math. We were drowning in children. <laughs> we were overseas, which means we didn't have the comfort of close friends and family or even a church body for meal trains and babysitters and just breathable space. I found myself often longing to escape the dark valley that we found ourselves in, sitting on the edge of that city, looking to that mountain peak, longing to live up there. And that's when it hit me that life doesn't happen on mountain peaks. Life is lived in the valley where there is both provision and beauty, but also peril and danger. And I think that's a constant human struggle that we all experience. We constantly long for this life to be a destination like a mountaintop and not the journey that it is. A constant paradise of all sun and no shadows. But deep down we all know it thou, that while we might experience mountaintop moments, we don't live on the mountaintop. Life is lived in the valley and the valley can be really, really hard. And that's the beauty of this psalm today. Today we're gonna to be in what's most likely the famous psalm of the psalms and potentially one of the most famous, if not the most famous chapter in all of scripture in Psalm chapter 23. The psalm is honest, it's real, but most of all it gives us hope for this journey that God has us on. And it shows us that while our journey is difficult and uncertain, we're not alone. Ultimately, this is what we'll see, that we have hope for the journey because our good shepherd is with us and he will most assuredly bring us safely home. So I wanna start by reading over this psalm that many of us have heard a hundred times. I wanna read it slowly, reflect reflectively, and I wanna pray one more time. If you wanna read along with me, by all means, it won't be on the screens, but if you have your Bible, but I might even encourage you just to close your eyes and let me read this over you. 
David writes, the Lord, Yahweh, God, he's my shepherd. I shall not want. He makes, he makes me lie down in green pastures. He leads me beside still waters. He restores my soul. My God leads me in paths of righteousness for his name's sake. And even though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I will fear no evil. For you're with me, your rod, your staff, they comfort me. You God, my shepherd, you prepare a table for me in the presence of my enemies. You anoint my head with oil, my cup, it overflows. Surely, goodness and mercy shall follow me every day, all the days of my life, and I shall dwell in the house of the Lord forever. Lord, what a promise. What a gift. Lord, I pray that as we dive deeply in this text today, I pray, Lord, that you would comfort our hearts, that you give us tremendous hope, that you would enable us to long for you even when we're on the mountaintops or when we have everything we feel like we need. Lord, I pray that we would realize that we need you. I pray that when we feel like we're in the valley of the shadow of death and we feel like we've lost everything, I pray that we would desperately cling to you in our need. I pray that you would open the eyes of our hearts this morning to see the beauty of this text, see the beauty of the gospel. Give us eyes to see, ears to hear that you might be glorified this morning in Jesus' name, amen. Well, this text, um, I won't say everything there is to say. You could fill libraries of books and sermons written on this text. So my focus today is to look at three aspects of this journey that we're in, our journey in the valley that can give us hope as we walk through this difficult and glorious valley of life Three aspects. The first is this, that our journey is very, very personal. David starts by saying something quite tremendous. He says, the Lord, using the word Yahweh, the highest name that he could possibly declare, that this Lord, he says, is not a shepherd, not our shepherd. What does David say? He is what? My shepherd. The Lord is my shepherd. I'll never forget the moment I was in high school, uh, no, college, um, had no money, had friends, we were bored, we found tickets to Nassau Bahamas for $25, and so like, let's go. We brought tents with us, that's how poor we were thinking we're going to camp on the beach, we get there, find out it's quite illegal and dangerous. <laughs> and so we find a very, very cheap motel up in the mountains. Well, one day as we're down on the beach... Uh, we met some nice people that we were hanging out. We noticed they had wristbands. They were staying at Atlantis, which was one of the most uh, prestigious resorts on the island, and they gave us their wristbands. Anybody ever been to Atlantis? <laughs> I have too, and I didn't pay for it. It was wonderful. <laughs> um, so we're at Atlantis. We're at the pool. We're hanging out. We're actually playing catch in the pool. We had found a ball, and you'll, we see Ken Griffey Jr. Anybody know Ken Griffey Jr.? Yeah. <laughs> Preach. Ken Griffey Jr. was one of the most uh, prestigious and talented baseball players to ever live. Um, they're on vacation. I'm noticing that nobody's going over to talk to him. I think everybody got the message. Kenny boy wanted to be left alone. Well, I had a plan. To, we're gonna meet Ken Griffey Jr. I noticed his kids were sitting on the, playing on the steps of the pool. And so as we're playing catch, I just kind of threw one a little bit too long and it landed right in front of his kids. And uh, you know, they pick it up and throw it back. Well, that accidentally happened a couple more times. Before long, we find ourselves playing catch with Ken Griffey's kids in the pool. And wouldn't you know it, five minutes later, you'll never guess who steps in the pool and joins in the circle. Ken Griffey Jr. I'm playing catch with Ken Griffey Jr. 
Now, before long, we find ourselves kind of sitting on the step. We're hanging out, find out he has a house in Orlando, and we're, you know, we're just getting to know each other, and we're talking, we're having a good time. He was actually really kind. Um, it was unforced. Uh, we had a really sweet conversation. It was one of the greatest moments of my life up to that point, until later that night, when we're out walking the town, and lo and behold, across the street getting ice cream is, you know who, Ken Griffey Jr. I'm like, that's my boy. <laughs> And so we're walking and I'm kind of waiting to see if he looks over and I'm like, he, he looks and I wave and he waves back and goes, hey, Justin, I couldn't believe it. <laughs> Ken Griffey Jr. knew my name. I moved from being a million, one in a million fan to being a friend. We were best friends as far as I'm concerned. <laughs> Now you can imagine our friendship ended that night. He didn't call, he didn't write. But for a brief moment, things got personal. One of the greatest baseball players to ever live knew my name. And that meant the world to me as a 21 year old college student. Here I see David knowing that David is not just a number in a crowd. God didn't lump David in with the rest of the nation. God didn't just wind David up, David up and let him go. The Lord, David knew, was just as much a shepherd of Israel as he was a shepherd of David. He knew David's name. The Lord, David says, is my shepherd. A phrase that shows us God is infinite. He is Yahweh, but Yahweh is David's shepherd. We see the personal nature of God he knows that God doesn't regard people generically, that we aren't unknown fans like I was to Ken Griffey Jr. before he became my best friend. Just as God is infinite in his greatness and his power and he is holy and separate from us, he's inf infinite in his ability to relate to each one of us personally, personally, intimately. He comes down to us. He likens himself to a humble shepherd who knows you by name. Let that sink in for a moment. Some of you absolutely need to hear that today. Listen how God speaks to Jeremiah the prophet. Jeremiah 1.5 says, before I formed you in the womb, I knew you. Or again, King David in Psalm 139 verse 1, oh Lord, you have searched me and you, you know me. The God of the universe knows me, David says. Verse 13, for you formed my in inward parts. You knitted me together in my mother's womb. The Lord deals intimately with his own. We are not just a number. You aren't just lumped into the crowd. The Lord, the journey, this journey is personal. Why? Because your good shepherd intimately knows you by name. I want to illustrate this through actual shepherds. I was doing research about shepherds and sheep. I, I'm an island boy, grew up on Sanibel. I know nothing about sheep. Back in the 60s, there was a court case in England where one shepherd was claiming that a few of his sheep had wandered off into another fold and he wanted them back. And so like, well, how do you possibly know? These folds are big. How do you know that your sheep are now over there? And his, his answer was that because I can recognize them. Now, of course, the, if you put up two pictures of sheep, I should have done this, and I asked you to tell them apart, you wouldn't be able to tell them apart. The court thought this was absurd, given how much sheep look alike, and so they conducted an experiment. They introduced three completely random sheep into a large fold of a shepherd. Now, these sheep were of the same breed, so they looked alike. And then they just set them loose and let them mix in and wander around, and they asked the shepherd to pick them out, and guess what? He was three for three. Not even Ken Griffey bats a thousand. He got every single one of them right. They were dumbfounded that he could possibly do that. They marked him with an X, they tested it, and sure enough. But his response was quite remarkable. I want you to see, they fortunately got this on video. This is his response, how did you, how did you do it? Can you lift her up? Right, there we are, right. Right, and by Jove, right again. <laughs> Wonderful. But how do you do it? 
Oh, well, what you asked me to do there, to be quite fair, wasn't difficult at all. Um, you always look at your sheep when you're tending them, and that's what a shepherd does, to see if there's anything wrong amongst them. As soon as there's something strange, you spot it. It stands out a mile. And these three sheep stood out a mile to me amongst all this lot. But why? Different colour, different faces, uh, different horns? Yeah, slightly, I suppose. I didn't even... I, it was a job to, to tell you the details of it. I just know they're different sheep. They might be a little higher on the leg, and they might have better faces, which I believe they did, than mine. But I, I wasn't really looking for that. I just saw that the sheep... You asked me to look for strange sheep, and that's what I found. I wish we still used the word by Joe. <laughs> he didn't even know how he knew. He just knew. Why? Because this shepherd deals intimately with his sheep. He just knows that he knows that he knows. What was crazy, the experiment went on because they were just dumbfounded by his ability to pick out those three sheep. He continues to baffle them. He says that he doesn't just know what they look like. He's like, I actually know every single one of their names. Now, he had so many sheep that they were given numbers for their names. I don't even like T11 or something like that. But he went on to say, I know every one of their names. And they asked, well, could you pick them out if we just went in and picked one out randomly? And sure enough, continue watching. If I pick on one of the ewes, do you think you would give me the number at this distance? I think it's very likely. I, I, I won't promise I won't make a mistake, but I, I think I know most of them. Let's see if I have a go. <laughs> Your shepherd can help me catch her. What about that one, for instance? I think that's S-52, daughter of N-8. Right? Her mother and her daughter are here somewhere. What's this one here? Can you see her? I can't see her very well. If I can get her out in the open a bit. Oh, that's T11. That's the sister of the one you caught just now, funnily enough. Is it? <coughs> yeah, T11 it is. Oh, I think that's 275. If it is 275, she's the mother of the... It is. Oh, she's the mother of the carcass champion in 1958 at Smithfield Show. Oh. <coughs> well, there you are, dear. You're recognized. Well, there you are. <laughs> <laughs> he didn't know what to say. <laughs> he knows their names. He knows their history. He knows their relationships with other. The shepherd intimately knows their sheep. And if a human, physical, finite man can do that with a couple hundred sheep, what more can our God do? How much more does our God know us? The Lord, David says, is my shepherd. He knows me by name. He deals intimate with it, intimately with me. He loves me. And if you are in Christ this morning, that's true for you. Listen to the words of Jesus. He says, I am the good shepherd in John 10. I know my sheep and my own know me just as the Father knows me and I know the Father. Amen. Let me ask you a question. How intimately does the Father know Jesus the Son? How intimately does the eternal Son know the Father? And Jesus says that I know you and you know me just as the Father knows me and I know him. Is that not... Wonderful news for us this morning. The journey's personal because your shepherd intimately knows you. And he knows you by name. And if we're going to endure the difficulties of this life, if we're going to be able to endure the dark valleys, we need to cling to that truth that you are not alone, that your God knows you, he loves you, and he knows your name. So the journey's personal. Secondly, the journey is intentional. There's a lot packed into verse one. The Lord, he says, Yahweh is my shepherd. And then he says, because the Lord is my shepherd, I shall not want. David is showing us that with God as his shepherd, he will never, ever in this life be left wanting. That's a bold statement. Kent Hughes, he's a pastor and author, wrote a commentary on this text, and he says that the idea, just for clarity's sake, the idea is not that God gives us everything that we ask for. Rather, in, he cares for us by giving us everything that we need. 
And that's precisely what King David is showing us in the rest of this psalm. The Lord, Yahweh, is my shepherd. He knows me, he cares for me, and because he's my shepherd, I will never be left wanting. But David knows what it takes for a shepherd to provide for a sheep because before David was a king, if you know this, he was a young boy assigned to be the shepherd for his family. And David knew in Israel that if you've ever been there or seen Israel, it's not exactly grassy valleys. It's dry, rocky sets of rolling hills covered with sparse and tough grass. For a shepherd to provide all that his sheep need takes a lot of precision and work and moving around. Shepherds were always on the move. But a good shepherd knew the difficulty of this task. And if he did his job right, His sheep were never left wanting. And so David illustrates this in the following verses. Verse two, he says that God, my shepherd, makes me lie down in green pastures. He leads me there and he makes me lie down. This same shepherd leads me where? Besides still waters and provides refreshment for me. The shepherd leads. The sheep trust the shepherd to provide and the sheep follow. Because the journey is intentional with the Good Shepherd. Charles Spurgeon, if you don't know who he is, he's one of the most famous old dead preachers, writes this that sheep have no need whatsoever to know the way across the trackless desert. It was enough for them that the shepherd knew. They need not know where the green pastures still remain throughout the droughts of summer or where, the, where there were quiet resting places where they might lie down at noon. It was sufficient for the sheep that the shepherd knew. And all that they had to do was patiently follow where he led the way. It was sufficient for the sheep to just know that the shepherd knows. And the sheep's job is to follow. When we trust God, We allow him to lead as opposed to us trying to lead him. And when we do that, David tells us that the results are clear. Look at verse three. The result is that our good shepherd restores my soul, David says. This is a word that means to return or be brought back to where it belongs. That when God leads us, he brings our souls back to where they belong in him, under him, in his intentional care as our good shepherd. And then he says this in the second half of verse three, that he leads me in paths of righteousness. Literally translated, he leads us on the right or true path. That whatever path God has you on is the right one. It's quite literally the righteous path. Not necessarily the path that you want, Not necessarily the path that you would have taken yourself on, but most certainly the path that you need. See, our tendency like sheep is to do what? Go astray. Orlando, I think it was you showed a video of a sheep getting pulled out of a pit. (laughs) I was gonna play it, but I already had two videos, so we're done with that. Gets released from a pit and happily jumps right back in. I can still hear the sound you made when you played it. Whee! (laughs) <laughs> so I remember, I was like, I didn't know you could do that in a sermon, but I guess so. Our tendency is to get out in front of the shepherd, to walk away from the shepherd. We see green pastures. We see places we want to go. Spurgeon continues and says that the sheep before the shepherd is out of place and out of order, but the sheep behind the shepherd, quietly, patiently, And humbly following him is both accurate to the order of nature and the order of grace. Let us then, Spurgeon says, as the Lord's sheep learn to take that position behind the shepherd, henceforth and not attempt to usurp the prerogative of our great shepherd. The best path for you and for me is the path that the shepherd has for us. It's an intentional path. He knows you intimately. He knows your every need. And so with David, we can proclaim, if I follow the shepherd who knows me, then I will never be left wanting. 
The journey's intentional, why? Because your good shepherd knows you and he knows your every need. So the journey's personal, the journey is intentional. And finally, the journey is secure. David continues famously writing one of the most famous verses in scripture that even though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I will fear no evil for you are with me. Your rod and your staff, they comfort me. The journey, David says, is secure. As I was reflecting on this section, I was reminded yet again of this mountaintop moment for me. And it was in that mountaintop moment in Italy when I realized, like, I realized that I had everything backwards. Why? I knew that we were in a dark valley moment of our lives. It seemed like the walls of life were caving in on every side. Everything seemed hard. And it was in that season that my prayer to my good shepherd was singular. Lord, what? Take me out of the dark valley. God was my ticket out. God was out there and I wanted him to bring me to where he was. But what's striking about this psalm is that it shows us a simple and profound truth that the same shepherd that leads us to still waters and green pastures leads us into dark valleys. The same shepherd that leads us to mountaintops. The same shepherd that provides the beauty of green pastures and the serenity of still waters leads us into dark valleys. Pastor Kent Hughes again comments on this saying that the valley of the shadow of death is as much the shepherd's right path as the green grass and the quiet waters. Do you believe that? When you have that perspective, it changes everything. Earlier I mentioned our common struggle. We want this life to be a constant mountaintop, not a valley, a destination, not a journey. And the reason I know that's true is because what happens when we find ourselves in the valley of the shadow of death? We grumble, we struggle, we get disillusioned, we even get angry at God. Why has he let me go? Why has he abandoned me? Why isn't he taking me out of this dark valley? But according to David, the valley, the dark valley is all part of the journey. The provision, the beauty of the valley also comes with peril and danger. David shows us that God never promises that we would be free from the threat of hardship or even death. But he does say that we don't have to be afraid. What's your most natural instinct when you're afraid? Run, right? If you wanna see my wife move, run a four minute mile, tie a lizard to a string. (laughs) That woman will never stop running as fast as she can. Usain Bolt wouldn't have anything on her. We run when we're afraid. But what's David doing in this dark valley? Look at the text. Walking. How could you possibly walk in in the face of threat and danger and death? Because David's not afraid. Even though, David says, I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I will fear nothing, no evil. Why? How can David not be afraid in the threat of death and danger and hardship? Look at the text. For what? You're with me. David knows that he is not alone. That same shepherd that knows him, that loves him, that cares for him, will provide for him. He will lead us on the right path. And that same shepherd that's with us in the green pastures is with us in the dark valleys. And oftentimes providing green pastures to lie down in, in the midst of our difficulties. Providing still waters for us to drink from in the midst of the shadows. David says his rod is there to protect me in the threat of danger. Why should I be afraid? His staff is there to guide me through the dangers. I know that there's a way out and my shepherd has one for me. He is with me in it and through it. 
The reason David doesn't have to be afraid, the reason we don't have to be afraid when life gets hard is because God is with us. David Powelson is an author and biblical counselor who recently passed from cancer and experienced years of a very deep and dark valley. And he writes these words. He says that God speaks to the fear and the dismay and isolation that attend our hardships, and he answers them with the monumental promise of his grace. I am with you. He answers with himself. When I was on that mountaintop in Italy, I felt a gentle invitation, a loving, gracious invitation from the Lord. He was inviting me to not look to see God as my ticket out of the trial, but he was inviting me to cling to him as my good shepherd within it. That mountaintop moment helped me realize that I was missing out on the intimacy that God was inviting me into that can only be found oftentimes in the darkness of the valley. God was inviting me to receive a greater portion of himself, not to escape from the valley in that moment, but to get God in it. I realized that God was not my ticket out, but he was my comfort and protection in what was at that time the hardest moment of my life. Which means no matter how threatening the valley may seem, our journey is secure because our good shepherd who has led us there will surely lead us out. And get this, even if leading us out is through physical death because when we close our eyes and we open them, we're in glory. There is no end for us. Do you get that? There is nothing that this world and our enemy can take from us because Jesus has secured it for us in the end. That's why the word can say, oh death, where is your sting? The journey is secure because your good shepherd is with you and he secured it for you. If you've never heard of the Pilgrim's Progress, it's an allegory written in 1678 by a writer and preacher with the name of John Bunyan. And he tells the story of a man named Christian who's making his way through a very difficult and hard path towards what was called the Celestial City. And at at one point, Christian finds himself in a very hard, dark valley to which Bunyan writes this. After he, Christian, had traveled in this difficult place for some time, he thought he heard a voice up ahead of him saying, though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I will fear no evil for thou art with me. Now Christian, we're, we're told, was glad because this. First, he believed that someone who feared God was in this dismal valley as well as himself. He wasn't alone. But secondly, he believed that God was with that person, whoever he was, or he could have never spoken such words. And so Christian says, if God is with him, then he most certainly is with me. Or I would have never heard these good words in the first place. Christian found courage in the valley, knowing that someone was there with him, someone who had gone before him. And just as God was with that person, enabling him to endure, so God will be with him. What I love about this psalm is that this psalm is pointing forward to a day when Emmanuel would truly come. God with us, God who becomes flesh. It's pointing to a day when Jesus Christ would confront the darkest of valleys of his very own. The son of God who lives in perfect intimacy with the father was cut off from the family, was enveloped and swallowed up by darkness and death, willingly walking into the darkest shadow of the deepest valley on our behalf, confronting the full weight of the father's wrath and our greatest enemies, sin and death, so that we can rest assured that the battle has been won. We just sang about it. I'm fighting a battle that's already won. No matter what what comes my way, I can overcome. We can have hope in the valley because we know that Jesus has crossed it for us and he's with us in it. That the journey, journey is secure because the good shepherd is with you and he secured it for you and he secured it by his blood. And 
And so the psalm ends, out of the valley, God putting down his shepherd's staff and taking on the role of a host. David continues in verse five, he says, you prepare a table for me. In the presence of my enemies, I'm still surrounded by threat. But what do you do? You anoint my head with oil and my cup is overflowing. There's abundance at your table. Surely, David says, goodness and mercy shall follow me all the days of my life and I shall dwell in the house of the Lord forever. David knows that even though he's surrounded by his enemies, he's secure. So secure that he can recline at the table and enjoy a good meal. That the goodness and mercy of his shepherd is with him no matter where he goes. And ultimately, David is showing us the end of the journey. The mountaintop that we all long to. The destination that we'll finally reside in. The day when we'll dwell in the house of the Lord forever. I just finished reading a fiction book called The Wing Feather Saga. It's written by a Christian author named Andrew Peterson. If you have teenage kids or younger, it's actually a tremendous book. I needed an easy read for the beach, and I found it. It was, it was actually a really, really good book. I'm in book two right now. It tells the story of a young boy named Janner who's 12 years old, who at a certain point in the book finds himself under the threat of death, and their village was being overrun by their enemies called the Fangs. And Janner is with his grandfather, who is, who is a very strong and courageous man by the name of Podo. And they find themselves running for their lives, fleeing their home for the forest. Their village was being burned down. We're told in the book that Janner looked up at Podo, his grandfather, at the white hair flying out behind him, bluish now in the moonlight. And Janner felt better. Maybe Poto didn't have a plan, he didn't really know, but knowing that his grandfather was with him, even, the face, even in the face of the fangs, made Janner feel like he could be more than he was. He drew strength from the old man, from the old man, like water from a well, and he rested in it. Isn't that beautiful? He drew strength from the old man, like water from a well, and he rested in it. I believe that's our invitation this morning. To enjoy the mountaintop moments, they will come. To celebrate them, to thank God for them. To realize that you need God just as much in those moments as you do when you're in the valleys. But realize that life is lived down in the valley where there are trees and where there's provision, but there's also peril and danger. The valley is hard. Our invitation this morning is to draw strength from our good shepherd like water from a well and rest in it. Our shepherd is good, he knows your every need. He's with us even in our darkest hours. So let's trust this morning in this life in our good shepherd, knowing that he alone will lead us safely home. As the band comes up, I just wanna make a comment. We're about to take a moment of communion together. Communion is for us a symbol, it's an invitation to respond. Before you focus on the elements, I just want to make, take a quick moment and remind us that we, this is a family meal. This is something that believers are invited to take in. If you do not belong to Jesus through faith, by grace, if you are not his, it's important to realize that all of the promises that we just read about in the Psalms are not yours yet. The Lord is the shepherd of his people. And we become his people, not by the good things that we do, but by believing that he alone is our shepherd. He alone is the one that could lead us to the mountaintop of glory as we place our faith in Christ. But if you're here this morning and you have believed in Jesus, this psalm is for you and this symbol is for you. It's an opportunity for us to remember the dark valley that Jesus went through, the valley of death and judgment so that we might be set free to enjoy his grace and his goodness and his mercy. So Jesus, on the night that he was betrayed by his friend, he took wine and he poured it and he opened it up and let's do that together. He said, this is my body, this is my blood shed for you to take and drink and to do this in remembrance of him. And likewise, he said, this is my body broken for you. 
broken by the staff of his father, his shepherd, for you and I. Take and eat. Let's cling to him. Let's remember that he's with us. And in light of that, let's continue in worship.